Welcome back to Switch to Linux. And today we want to talk a little bit more about some business stuff, continuing in our weekly installment talking about business and FOSS. And today we're going to start talking about server technologies, and we're going to do a few videos with some server applications. Mostly we're going to have a look at some of the, the options that you have available to you, do a little bit of reviews, maybe a little bit of installs. So what precipitated this is right now there's going to be some servers, services I'm going to be looking into. I'm self-hosting on my own platforms, but I want to test some of these out before throwing it onto my online server. So I'm creating a little server internal on my network that I can use to test these guys out. And then if I get something nice, then I'll go ahead and uh, transmit that out to, uh, to the live sites. Or some of these services are going to stay on internal servers and internal networks. And this is what we kind of want to talk about today is what do you put on a public facing internet service and what do you put on an internal LAN service that is available to your office, which you can even make available to your workers via a a VPN into your office but without actually compromising your services because they're open to the rest of the world. In other words, you might have seen a lot of these things with Amazon secure Amazon servers, S3 buckets is what they're called not being secure. And then a hacker will get in there and then they'll bust on in and then before you know it, the whole database leaked. Well, what happened there is that when you set up an S3 bucket, what they did is they failed to set up the security groups properly. Maybe they left the whole thing open. Maybe they left the database with a default password. Whatever the case is, oftentimes this is happening because the security teams or the people designed to build the applications are sometimes the, the lowest bidders. And the lowest bidders do not generally do a good job. And so they'll create some service and then they'll push it on out and forget that they used admin. Admin is the database login passwords, which can happen sometimes. And uh, these are kind of some of the issues. You do not want that to happen. You do not want your data to leak out like that. Now, you can secure your data even more by making sure that your data is not even accessible to the rest of the internet. You can accomplish this with a VPN because VPNs were originally designed so that people working from outside the organization can connect in through a VPN and access the internal company's internet. So in other words, if I'm doing my accounting software, I have no need to have my accounting software outside on the whole internet. But if I wanted to bring in somebody to do some accounting software for me, I'll say here, you need to use a VPN client and here is the VPN information. That person will then be inside my network accessing things on my own internal servers. All right, so that's the direction that we want to move into. Some applications you do want on the public internet because they're not necessarily the, either they're not the, they don't have the highest security requirements or they're things that you need your wider team to have access to. Things like we're going to be looking at some Trello alternatives. Of course, Trello is a free service that allows you to put together your projects and have all of these logins. And then the team members can come in and see what their various tasks are. And then they can mark the tasks as the various progresses as they're moving through the phases. Well, that type of thing it's not the most sensitive company data. You can have that open. Now, I don't want to use Trello because of it's a big tech company. They're going to be grabbing and harvesting data. Who knows what they're doing with it? And so we're going to be looking at some free and open source alternatives to that. The one, there's a few actually good ones out there like Taiga is good. Uh, I'm actually going to be looking at Canboard simply because Taiga is going to take a lot longer to get installed versus Canboard. Hey, quick and easy. Why not? And uh, so that's kind of, we're going to be having a look at each of these. We'll show you Canboard first, and when I have the, the available time, then I'll put together and, and work on a Taiga build to have a look at those. But we're really looking at these types of things. So before we get into some of the types of software we're going to look at, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. The first is, there's several applications needed to manage a business. What type of applications do you need? If you're a heavy customer-focused system, you're going to need some type of CRM, you know, customer relationships uh, management tool. So the biggest one of these in the field, of course, is Salesforce. There's an excellent free and open source version called Sweet CRM. I've used it before and it's great. It works wonderfully. 
So we'll look at those individual things. What other types of software do you need? And then you need to look at the types of software and figure out which one of these needs to be public facing. I want my CRM public facing most likely because we're going to have more people on the team. You're going to, people are going to be accessing it from the road, particularly if you're meeting with individual clients. So in my case, we're working on building out a publishing company. And so, you know, I might be having people going through towns, talking to the small bookstores, and we'll need to access that stuff easily from mobile hotspots, whatever else. That's something I want on more of a public internet. So the types of things that I might not want on there, we've already talked about, is the accounting software. Only a small, limited niche of people need to have that. They need to have higher security levels. And so we're looking at those types of things. Data clouds. These are interesting. Do you want the data clouds all publicly accessible? Now, Nextcloud is very well looked at and very secure. I have no problem putting a Nextcloud server on a on a public internet service as long as you're doing it right. So that's definitely uh, an option there. Obviously your website needs to be publicly facing, uh, but you might have you might have some other tools that we'll look at that are not. Now the next thing we wanna do is we need to figure out how to make sure we are securing these servers. In general, I'm not a fan of putting up a server closet in my spare office in a small residential type setup. If I had a big, you know, a big commercial internet, a big commercial everything, I would be, I would be more comfortable about doing that and I probably would. But because we're working at building a business, out, at least starting it out of, a, out of a small office in a home, we don't wanna do that type of stuff. So I have no problem and I would recommend, in fact, hiring out the servers for your publicly facing things. And then you can just ask what types of things you need. So like right now I'm doing cPanel with a lot of my clients and things. One of the challenges that I'm encountering right now though is that cPanel is starting to seriously raise their fees, like happens anytime you have a type of licensing thing. It's gonna actually start costing me a boatload of extra money. This is what got me interested in looking at ISP config. So right now I'm building an ISP config, which is sort of like an open source management tool, not too unlike cPanel. Well, for the, the VPS services that I use, I'm using a small VPS service to manage all my clients' websites through a cPanel, which is costing me upwards of $40 a month because of the cPanel licensing. Well, if I find that ISP config does just as good, if not a better job, I can actually drop down to a much smaller server or pay a little bit less for a much beefier, faster server for everybody, migrate my cPanel onto an ISP config panel instead. And in this case, we can actually drop our prices because we're using free and open source software and we're not worrying about the big licensing fees. And that's really what the purpose we're doing here is we're learning how to avoid a lot of the licensing fees on the one hand, or we're learning how to avoid a lot of the data collection on the other hand. So when we're talking about FOSS technologies and web servers, we have to figure out where do you want the things hosted? What can be an offline via a local network that you have, which you can set up with a Raspberry Pi. Buy a Raspberry Pi for you know 50 bucks for a whole kit you can install an entire web server on that and manage all of your internal structures that don't need to be internet facing. And then as long as you learn how to use something like ISP config, then you can buy that at a much cheaper rate, as little as $5 a month in most places. Uh, check my uh, A2 hosting affiliate link there and uh, you can actually get a VPS already configured with ISP config out of the box. You're up and ready to go in a second and that's actually gonna enable you to, to get moving. So in reality, you can save yourself a lot of money. You can, therefore you can increase your profits by learning how to use the free and open source software. And right now we're gonna move into kind of a phase where we're looking at a lot of web-based technologies. So let me know what type of web-based technologies you're looking for false alternatives for in the comments down there. And I will add those to the list to prioritize and look at and do videos maybe sooner rather than later. So pretty soon, um, I'll probably be doing a review of ISP config soon. I have it set up now. It took me about three days to build it out. It's not likely I'm going to do a video about how to set that up because that's pretty advanced stuff. But well, at least we are going to do a review of it. And I'll tell you, you can go to A2 Hosting, use my affiliate link, 
buy a VPS and select the Debian ISP config server and you can have that up and running if that's going to work for you. So those are some of the options that, that we have. So uh, with that, we'll uh, wrap this video up here. Thanks for watching and uh, let me know in the comments down below the types of open source and FOSS software that you need for your business and I will absolutely have a look at those and I will use your comments to prioritize what we look at sooner rather than later. So thanks for coming along and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash T-O-M-M or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.